I'm going to attempt something quite ambitious tonight, um, and it's going to get a little philosophical. Um, I'm going to attempt to give you an overview over the whole of the, of the morning course of Rudolf Steiner's first teacher's course. That is 14 lectures that he gave over two and a half weeks to a group of 24 people who had been hand selected, invited personally to come and attend this particular event. And Rudolf Steiner in 1919 was an incredibly busy man. He was um, well used to giving lectures in front of 1,500 people. So big convention halls, you know, like trades, trade fair centers would be hired to accommodate Steiner's lectures on especially social issues, um, but also sometimes on esoteric questions. And so for him to say, you know what, for two and a half weeks, I'm going to do nothing other than ward of school was quite a thing, quite a gesture to clear his schedule in that way. Um, so from late August to early September 1919, he worked just with these two dozen people. And it's probably important to know that while these people knew what they were being called towards, they were not given a guarantee that they would become teachers. So it's not like nowadays we would say we need a class five teacher and then interview for that position. Um, these people were asked would they like to be considered for becoming part of the first college of teachers and then given the opportunity to attend these lectures and they only found out on the last day before the school opened whether they were going to be accepted as teachers and which class they were going to teach. Can you imagine that? for a moment. Yeah? You've sat through this whole thing and then on that last Saturday before the school opens officially on the Sunday you're being told you're going to be the class two teacher or maybe we'll come back to you in, in, a, in a year or two but right now you're not going to be part of that first circle. So this is quite a, a special atmosphere in which this took place and the, the very fact that not everybody knew whether this was going to be for them probably also ensured a very active and alert participation on the part of the, the participants. So the course is divided up into three parts. Um, in the morning, after breakfast, so to speak, when they first arrived, Rudolf Steiner gave a course which is now called Anthropological Foundations. For many years it was known as the study of man. Um, the most recently published book before this one was called Foundations of Human Experience and this was followed after coffee time by a course that had to do more with didactic and methodical questions. So how do you teach which part of the curriculum and this is now called Methods of Teaching, that course. And in the afternoon from three o'clock till six o'clock they had seminars, exchanges, to begin with, Steiner explains in those what children are like. So we learn about the famous four temperaments in those, in those lectures. But as time goes on, he gives jobs to teachers, to, to these up and coming teachers. He would say something like, can you present the Mississippi River to us tomorrow? So you have to imagine that that's, this is at being told, you're being told this at half past six at night and there are you don't have access to the internet. You can't Google the Mississippi. All the libraries are closed. So what do you do? These are really big challenges that Steiner gave to, the, to those up and coming teachers. And he didn't just say who would like, he said, you will do this, you will do this, you will do this. So he, he was quite specifically challenging, I think, towards the people that he had earmarked maybe in his mind for particular tasks. So there are 45 lectures altogether. And until last year, they were only published in three separate books. And it's uh, for the first time on the occasion of the centenary that they were all put together into one book, which was published in time for the centenary. And this is the book, this is the German book. Yeah? Um, 
So that's the size of it. Okay, so you have that, those all those lectures, and you've got the commentary in it, and you've got facsimile kind of things. And then this is the translated version. Um, this, is what it, this is what it looks like in English. Uh, it's not only does it only cost a third of the price, it's only half as, as thick, which is really interesting. I, I, I love that. So this was uh, translated for the first time by one and the same person, all three books, and it's, they're now all in here. Um, if you're interested, you, I've put details on how to order it in the, at the top of the chat, so you can find that there. But let's go into it now. I'm going to focus almost exclusively on this thing called anthropological foundations tonight. So we're going to start with that really. And the reason for that is that in these 14 lectures, Steiner examines the human being. How does the human being think, feel and act? And how do we react to our various stages of consciousness? So being fully awake, being somewhat semi-awake and dreamy, being completely asleep to various things. And finally, how is the human physicality, the human body, an expression of the spirit that lives on the earth? Okay, so um, it's quite an ambitious undertaking and these lectures are very dense and they're intended really to become a sort of lifelong study. Going back to them again and again, um, is definitely a source of inspiration and discovery for you as a serving teacher or as somebody who's interested in the human being, actually. Education doesn't come into it explicitly very much um, into these particular 14 lectures, but you will find, and I will point out again and again, how relevant they really are for things that happen in the classroom. Without this course, there would be no world of school. It's as simple as that. If I teach about this course at the master's level in Stuttgart, um, then I have a whole week to, teach, to talk about one lecture. And today I'm going to try 14 in 45 minutes. So we'll see how that's, how that's going to succeed. To begin with, um, in the first lecture, Steiner talks about the duality of the human being. And I think I've shown you this diagram in the very first lecture I gave on Prairie on prelude. This diagram represents our twofold nature. Part of it, part of us is generically determined, predisposed. So you and I, we've all come down to earth in a particular part of the world. We've incarnated as male or female, as pink or brown, as German or English or Kenyan, and we can't do very much about that. We have, we have the genes we have. We are subject to the culture that we've grown up into. And there is nothing we can really do very much to completely emancipate ourselves from that. And yet, this generic part of us doesn't determine who we are. It informs who we are, it colors who we are, but it doesn't define who we are. For that, we need that other part of us that part of you which isn't your sister or your brother, although you share the same genes, although you share the same culture. It's that part of you which is absolutely unique and is only there in the world once. And that's your spirituality, if you like, yeah? your, your access to the universal. And if we put those two things together, we could say this is where spirit meets body. We open up, in, like in a Venn diagram, an area that is accessible to us. And that you could say is the stage on which all our earthly life takes part and this is the, the human soul. At the beginning, the spirit and the body aren't really particularly strongly connected. Yeah? So you have that part of the baby which is a complete mystery to us and you have that part of the baby which is a completely complete mystery to the baby, which is the body and the culture. And during our earthly lives, those two parts merge, don't they? When you come to my time of life, um, you have a fairly good idea who you are and you have a fairly good idea about your body. In fact, the older you get, the better you understand your body. Um, and this, this process of growing together never stops. 
And in this first lecture, very programmatically, Steiner says to his listeners that that's what education is about, is to bring those two parts together harmoniously. <coughs> but it's not the task of the teacher to do that. It's the task of the growing person to do that. So it's my task as, a, as an earth citizen to strive for, this, for the harmony in this central realm, in this soul realm, and my teachers can only do, can only influence that by helping me create an environment in which that happens as harmoniously as possible, in which I have an ideal situation to do that. Okay, so this is the harmonization of the generic, the cultural, with the universal and individual. That's the task of, of self-education for which education provides the environment. And in the second lecture, then he goes immediately into something quite difficult. Many people who start reading this book come to lecture two and think, well, maybe it wasn't for me after all. I'll be honest with you, um, because there's a hurdle there straight away. And if you come past that hurdle, it gets easier again. So don't be put off by this. In this second lecture, Steiner explains what thinking is. And I need you to do a mental exercise for a moment. Um, I'd like you to think of a practical object, seeing that um, you're all using one right at this moment. Let's make that practical object a chair. Can you try and think of, a ch of that chair that you're sitting on and not picture it? You can only just manage that, can't you? But now think of a chair in your kitchen that you're not sitting on right now. Think of another chair in your house, an armchair in the living room, whichever one you're not using right now, so you have no physical contact with it. Can you think of that without picturing it? That becomes quite difficult, doesn't it? And you see, this is what Steiner explains at the beginning of the, of the lecture, is that all our thinking is basically based on images. This is what we draw on when we think, on past experiences. Even if somebody has never seen a chair in their lives, they're going to have to construct a chair in their imagination from things that are a bit like a chair that they have seen before. In contrast to this, um, you could say they are the things that we do, action. Sometimes it's called the will. And if, you, if we're honest with ourselves, it's almost the exact opposite. I can't have a complete picture of the things I'm doing because I don't know what will happen when I do them. I know if I pick up a piece of wood like this and I drop it, then it will fall into my hand. But that's not all that happens, is it? All sorts of other things happen because of it. I don't know what happens under my skin as a result of the impact of that piece of wood. I don't know anything about the molecules that come off it when it lands or while it flies. So I don't have a clear picture of anything, of everything that happens when I act. And so Steiner unpicks that in this lecture. So let's try and find out what the relationship is between our thinking and our doing. So an image is always sub-real. So an image of a tree is not a tree. I can picture my nose, but I can't smell anything with that image. It's obvious, isn't it? So it's less than real. On the contrary, or as opposed to that, a seed, a future orientated thing that has, that will do something sometime ahead of me is super real. Take an example, take as an example, the acorn that has fallen off the oak tree. Um, if you, if you cut it open, there's no little tree in there, is there? And yet it contains the whole future oak tree. It's in there, but it's more than real. It's not there yet. Whereas the picture of the oak tree is less than real. You could say the acorn of the oak tree, the seed for the future is super real. One is connected to the past. The other is connected to the future. Thinking to the past, the will, the action to the future. If you're versed with the language of Eurythmy, you might express it in this way, that in order to access the past, I have to distance myself from it. 
So anything that I can picture is clearly not me. So I'm have, creating a distance. Whereas anything that is future orientated, I have to go towards in that m gesture. I have to reach for it in order to, to understand it. So that would be another way of putting it. Putting it. One relies on memory. The other one relies on my ability to imagine it in the future. And that gesture that I just created, that I characterized with a G, Steiner calls antipathy. And the gesture that I've just characterized with a M, Steiner calls sympathy. I reach for something. So within that, then where am I? <laughs> I'm in between this antipathy thinking memory on that side and on that side the future the action the sympathy where do i live well i live in the present and in between this thinking realm in of the past and the will realm of the future is my present and that is the feeling and if we're really honest to ourselves to, with ourselves nothing we ever do isn't colored by feeling is it if you're really honest, you know, we tend to think of mathematics or science as purely kind of cognitive or maybe, you know, emptying the bins as purely an action, but nothing is ever not connected with feeling because we're human. And feeling, taking feeling seriously is one of the great things about a lot of education in theory and in practice. So in this feeling realm, we're moving between this, these forces of sympathy and antipathy, as Steiner calls them. And one of us, one of them allows us to understand who the child is. And the other pole enables us to connect to the child and love the child. And you can see immediately if, if I stayed, if I stayed with one of those poles, if I stayed permanently on one of the, the sides of this blue line, I would not do justice to my profession. I can have all the understanding of the child. If I don't love it, I'm not a good teacher. I can love the child devotedly, but if I don't understand how children learn, I can't be a teacher either. I need both those qualities in my professional life. And then he moves in lecture four to this rather provocative statement. He almost gives a definition, although not quite. He says that feeling is incomplete will, and will is feeling acted out. I'm going to spare you my voice for 30 seconds while you think about that. Can I, can I challenge you to just think both those thoughts next to each other? So if you apply that first general sentence to an actual feeling, love, hate, jealousy, rage, can you see that that feeling is really wanting to, um, to continue into an action? <laughs> and if you think of any action that you ever perform, was it not preceded by an impulse, by a feeling impulse that led you there? I think if this is where, where he's coming from. And of course, this will or action aspect, um, the more advanced we become within our organization, the more conscious it becomes. We have, as Steiner points out in, in this lecture, um, nine levels of consciousness in our action. The very basic one we share with most, with all animals in a way, and that is our instinct. Instinct is something that is always there. The, the, the picture Steiner gave, gives is the picture of the beaver. And if I asked you what do beavers do, you will probably say, well, they fell trees and build dams. And if I ask you then, okay, when the beavers finished building the dam, what do they do? You will have said, well, they light a pipe and they sit back because they've done their bit. But that's, of course, not what happens. What do beavers do when they finish building their dam? they fell more trees and build more dams because they can't stop. 
They're physiologically designed to fell trees and build dams, not because they need them, but because it's their instinct to do so, which is why one beaver can cause a huge amount of wetland um, flooding in, in low-lying areas with roads and so on. Yeah, it's, they, they never stop. They never stop felling trees. Felling dams. We've got an inner beaver too. We have certain instincts that just carry on whether we're conscious of them or not. Then we have drives, which to some extent decide what we do for us. So it's the drive that moves us towards eating or drinking, for example, to going to the toilet, to um, have sex, I suppose. Um, although that's already mixed in with the one above that, with the desire. For a drive, I usually need some kind of outer impulse. Something will remind me of my drive, of, you know, I smell pizza and I get hungry. That, that's the drive there. But if I've now just mentioned the word pizza and you get hungry, then you're already moving towards the desire kind of aspect. And in fact, if you're on holiday and you miss your wife, that's then you're definitely in the realm of desire because there's nothing there reminding you of her. You're just conscious of the fact that you'd quite like to spend time with her now. That's desire. It's not prompted and we can turn it off. Drives and instincts are kind of always in our, in our makeup. So animals have all of those. What animals don't have is the next level up, if you like, which is what human beings have, which is our motive. Because I can understand my instinct, I can understand my drives and my desires, and I can try to apply consciousness to them. For example, when I would stop smoking. Yeah. Um, so this is something that I have where I'm slightly more advanced than an animal would be. And then I'm going beyond that to the realm where Shana calls that the spiritual realm, where I'm not quite where I want to be. So let's say you've done something. We're always talking about actions here. Let's say you've done something and you regret it. Well, not really regret it, but you wish you could have done it better. That's not a reality yet, is it? That's not you, that's who you want to become. I'd love to be the person who can do this better. That's, that means you have a wish that you feel about. So let's say, you know, somebody brings a piano into your house, you sit down and you rather clumsily play a little bit of a tune. And afterwards um, you say to your family, oh yeah, sorry about that, that, that wasn't great, was it? I wish I was better at playing the piano. That wish won't make you better at playing the piano. <laughs> you need to do something about it, don't you? You need to have an intent to practice every day. That will make you better. Um, and you need to keep on with that intent. And this is something that you either will manage to do or you will not manage to do. In other words, the human being isn't perfect. We're reaching. We're reaching all the time. And when we get to that top level, the decision level, then we're really at that place where we have a complete handle on our lives. And if you're anything like me, You've got quite a long way to go um, on that particular thing. But then the human being always was and always will be a work in progress. In lecture five, Steiner reminds us once more of the, the fact that sympathy and antipathy are not the same as positive and negative. We tend to think of them that way, don't we? We are antipathetic to, towards somebody who, doesn't, who we don't like sympathetic to something that is attractive to us. So your child, if you're a parent, and most of you are, your child needs to feel antipathy towards you. It's absolutely vital that they do, right from the moment of birth, otherwise they'll stay in your womb. And that continues that journey. Their whole life journey is one of emancipation and they will need to be antipathetic towards you. In other words, they need to know their boundaries. I am not you. If I don't feel that, I will never develop personality. However, if all my life is about separating myself, then it's not going to be a very happy one. So I also need to learn the art of connecting myself with things and developing enthusiasm. And just like in that image I showed you a short time ago, this is part of our life's journey. 
To give it a very simple diagram, you could do it like this. When the child is first born, in, in a way they're unreflected sympathy, aren't they? So a very young child sees something attractive and they go towards it, don't they? So you have this classic image of it, you, you plonk a child in the, sand, in the sandbox and another child comes with an attractive toy, what does the child do? They crawl over there and they take it. And then you have this whole brouhaha between parents where you're trying not to offend each other and sorting this out. But and, and I've seen parents try to explain to their 18-month-old child why that is an immoral thing to do. And of course, you're right in trying to do that. It just won't work, not at this age yet. But later on, of course, this is your job. As an adult, we as adults need to instill antipathy into the child, as weird as that sounds. And that antipathy comes in the form of moral ideals. That boy brought that toy and he wanted to play with it and you made him cry by taking it away. And I need to teach you about the fact that that's not all right, <laughs> whether you like it or not. So I'm going to insert some antipathy into your, into your, into your life, if you like. Um, so this is our task. And having sort of gone all this way, now we're looking, we're moving away from the soul life now. So we've talked a lot about thinking and feeling and willing in these first five lectures and now in the lectures six to nine we're looking at the human spirit and this sounds very grand until I'm saying well it's actually stages of consciousness that we're talking about here so if I say to you the sentence um, Alan has put on a jumper against the cold then you are able to completely understand every aspect of that statement. You understand Alan, you understand has put on, which means that he put it on at some point and is still wearing it. A jumper, you know what that is. And it's only logical that he put it on because it was cold, not because it was warm, okay? So every part of that statement you can verify as a true statement. When we work in cognit in the cognitive area, we are completely awake. A logical statement can be examined with a full awakening. Now try and apply, go to the other extreme and apply the same degree of wakefulness to your actions, to your will. Right now, for example, if you are standing, just lift your foot. If you're sitting at your desk, just lift your hand. Now put it down again. And now, before you lift your hand, try and make every muscle that contributes to that action understand what they need to do. Yeah. So several dozen nerves and muscles now have to work together. Can you send each of them the wakeful signal so that their collective collaborative work results in you lifting that organ? Oh my goodness me, how would you even go there? Is that even possible? Can you do such a thing? I wouldn't know how. Um, so in the field of our action, we are quite asleep. And actually, we have to be quite grateful for that as well, because um, if you're like me, you've eaten supper not that long ago. And if you now had to be completely alert to what that is just doing right now in your stomach and on the way south from your stomach, then you probably would find what I'm trying to bring to you even harder to follow uh, because your, your whole attention would be taken up with that, wouldn't it? So thank God we don't um, have complete consciousness in that realm. And then there's that bit in between again. Remember that's always been the middle realm all this time. If we're not fully awake in our feeling life and we're also not completely asleep because we kind of know how we feel, don't we? We just don't know why we feel that way. Then what is the analogy here? And here Stana says, well, it's the dreams. Um, he says the sentence goes, we know our feelings like we know our dreams. They clearly have an impact on us, but we're not always entirely sure what they mean. And I think by dreams, he doesn't mean nightmares and you know dreams that we have when we literally sleep but also the sort of daydreaming that, that goes on. What inspires that? 
and what are its consequences. Um, this is less accessible to us, but it's deeply relevant to education because mot motivation really relies on feeling the right thing. This is lecture six now. Imagine for a moment a child that isn't working very hard, a lazy child, a complacent, um, underachieving, floppy child, whose parents tell him, you've got to try harder to concentrate. You've got to try harder not to daydream. You've got to try harder to work. And they say, yes, I will. And they don't manage. Why not? And the reason is because they don't want to, because they're not motivated to doing so. And their parents will say, well, don't you realize that you're not going to get a proper job if you don't have good grades at school? Don't you understand that you're falling short of your potential? And the child says, yes, I do understand that I'm not stupid, but it's boring. Why? I just can't. I, it's just facts and figures and learning stuff by heart that I'm not interested in. I just can't pick up the energy to concentrate on this. And that's where the problem is, you see. Um, I can understand through my thinking why something is necessary and good. Will it lead me to action? No, it won't. The only way I can get into action is if I feel that this is valid. I feel it is relevant and I want to do something about it. Take global warming, for, exa for example. We all understand the science. How many of us are active? The ones who care. Who care, who feel the pain, who feel I can't live unless I do something about this. Yeah, that's, that's what motivates us, not, not the science, not our understanding, that comes first. But in this lecture, Stein also says, this is not a ladder, this is a circle. So you can activate the thinking through the doing, through the will. And I'm not, I don't have time to go into this now, but this has led to the idea that we integrate head, heart and hand, so that through doing something, I'm somehow unlocking my understanding of it. The form drawing course I'm just teaching in, in Thailand is a good example for that, yeah? where I do something and in the doing it, in the drawing of the circle, I begin to understand the qualities of a circle, much better than if somebody talks to me about pi and radii. Yeah? If in trying to draw freehand a perfect circle around a dot, um, I understand much better than if I, if I only have it explained to me. But this journey continues through our lives, this waking up towards our activity. In lecture seven, Steiner talks about the fact that we gradually separate the will from our feeling and we lead it towards our thinking. You know, when I just said that understanding something doesn't really make us do want to do that thing, that's certainly true when we're a child. You know, take the hungry baby. And the father who goes to the hungry baby who's crying and says, your mummy can't feed you right now. She's really, really tired. Let her sleep a little bit. You must feel sorry for her, surely. What does the child do? He carries on crying. Yeah, they don't. That understanding won't lead to, to an action. Yeah, because they're, they're, they are upset. That's why they're crying. You know, their will is so connected with their emotion that this is how it comes out. With an older person, it becomes increasingly more obvious that, uh, or more, that we become increasingly capable of doing something that we don't want to do because we know it to be the right thing. Yeah, I'm hard up, um, I walk through the street, I find a purse that somebody's dropped and it contains 2,000 pounds in cash. Now, this is the answer to my prayers, right? Because my car needs to go to the back garage and I don't have money to, to, to pay for it. So I so want to keep this money. I can override that with my thinking. Not if I'm eight years old, but if I'm 18, it's easier 
If I'm 28, it's even easier. The older I get, the easier it becomes to override that. And this is the journey that that emancipation that I talked earlier on will enable. My relationship to the world is characterized in the process of perception. If I perceive a tree, I obviously am aware of the fact that that tree isn't me. But I perceive it in more ways than one. And the way Steiner puts it in lecture eight is that we participate in the inner being of that tree. And the way we do that is we unlock it. So whatever comes towards it here on the left doesn't go straight into us, into our head, into our eyes, into our ears, but it gets broken down into different levels of experience. And those different levels, Spanner calls 12 different senses. We tend to assume, I certainly grew up with this, that we only have five senses. Um, and Steiner adds some of them, some to it, but he's not the first, by no means the first or only person to do so. So this is, this is not something Steiner invents necessarily. Um, and there are some surprising ones here, like the sense of life, for example. Just ask yourself right now for a moment whether you're feeling well. Can you see that that's not quite the same as if I'm asking whether you're feeling warm or hungry? or stressed. This ability to, set, to tell whether you're in a good space or not is a conglomeration of various impressions that all come together in what Steiner calls the sense of life. At the other end of the spectrum, there's something he calls the sense of thought, which is not about perceiving our own thinking, but the intention of someone else. This is something British people are amazing at the sense of thought. I, as, as, a, as a German who's lived here for a long time, I sort of just about get it now. But when I first came to Britain, I had no idea how this worked, this system. I would ask a British person a question about a third person. I'd say, you know, this fellow student of ours, what do you think of him? And that person would say, and be quite serious in saying, well, he's a bit, isn't he? And I'd say, he's a bit, what? What are you talking about? Yeah. Nowadays, all the, all the, all the English people among you know exactly what I was saying just now. Beca why? Because you picked up with your sense of thought what my intention was in using those very non-descriptive words. That's the sense of thought that with which we reach out to somebody else's meaning. It's a fascinating field, this field of the 12 senses. And if you decide to do a teacher training, we'll spend a lot of time on this because looking after a multi-sensory experience of the child is one of the most fun things about world of education, yeah? both from a giver as from a receiver point of view. The fact that our education is multi-sensorily oriented is just such a brilliant thing. As is the next thing, lecture nine. When we have reassembled our perceptions using our 12 senses, we have a conclusion. That's a bit irritating that the word conclusion is at the beginning of a process, but it actually comes at the end of the process of perception. So you've got the actual lion, you've got our 12 senses making sense of what's coming towards us there and coming to the conclusion as something animal shaped and scary coming towards us. Then we bring to that other concepts that we already have, that we're not particularly aware of, and we discuss with ourselves, what is this thing? It's fairly large, it's growling at me, it has big teeth, and um, it looks very much like a cat, but more so. Yeah? So we bring all these old concepts together and we form a new concept, and that's the concept of the lion. And if we're honest to ourselves, all learning goes through those stages and it has to. And if it doesn't, we're not really interested. I have an experience, I put that experience into context and then I can own the concept and make it my own. And the, sh the shocking thing is, 
that many of us went to school in a system that didn't allow us to, to follow that. It went to school where the concept came first. So the teacher comes into the classroom in the physics lessons and he says, today I'm going to demonstrate to you that sound travels. So he tells us the concept and then he proceeds to prove his hypothesis. But, and he wonders why we're all misbehaving and nobody's interested because he's already told us the answer. Why would we still pay attention? Isn't it much more interesting if my teacher tells me to stand at the other end of the running track and then does this? And I don't hear a clap until two seconds later. And then that generates a question in myself and I then have to contextualize that question and then I arrive at the concept myself with the help of my teacher. This is the famous three-stage rhythm that you may have heard about in World of Education. And it's not called a three-day rhythm, it's a three-stage rhythm because it goes through these three stages. In the same lecture, we are being asked to not rely on definitions. You know, when somebody gives a talk and they, and they pick up the Oxford Dictionary and they, say, and they say, well, you want me to talk about leaves? Well, this is what the Oxford Dictionary says. The term leaf refers to the organ that forms the main lateral appendage on the stem of vascular plants. <laughs> Any questions? Well, quite, yes. Well, it's a lot more interesting to actually look at a leaf, isn't it? But do I understand what a leaf is by looking at a leaf? Holding it, touching it, smelling it? Not really. All I understand it was what this leaf is. That doesn't yet tell me what a leaf is. It becomes much more clear when I look at different types of leaves. If I contrast the maple to the conifer leaf, then I'm getting a much clearer idea. And this is something Steiner suggests here as a methodical step in education to characterize things. If I've studied a maple leaf and a conifer leaf, do I have a fixed definition of leaf? Not really. My definition of leaf will change the moment that leaf comes to me in autumn and it's suddenly not green anymore but brown, or in winter, when it's virtually black. In other words, my concepts can become alive, can stay alive and can change when they need to change, when something changes. So this is, this is still to do with the stages of consciousness and our exhortation to relate to the things in our environment in a living kind of way. Now we're moving to the really difficult part of the lecture course. If you thought what I've brought so, so far to you was complicated, then just hold on a little longer. Um, it's gonna get harder from here. Remember how I said earlier on that the last lectures are about the physical human being revealing the spirit's work in the material. So in other words, outer forms reveal inner realities. You know, things aren't the shape they are for random reasons. They are like that because they're meant to be like that. And Steiner draws this rather weird little being um, to illustrate the threefoldness of the human body. This is all about the human body now. And I'm just going to briefly shock you into submission um, by bringing the concept of the double metamorphosis to you. So it's quite easy to imagine that the center of the head is at the center of our head because it's a sphere, more or less. So the center has got to be in there somewhere, right? When it comes to our chest organization, if you remember the diagram I just showed you before this, yeah, you could imagine that actually the, the, the solid part is behind the spine and at the front it sort of opens up, doesn't it? So you can, can you imagine that what we've got back here is a part of a sphere and the, the, the rest of the sphere is sort of out in front of us, would be probably visible if you were really fat, yeah? Um, and the center of that actually lies outside. In fact, it lies where our hands are. Can you see that? Yeah, this is the operational field of our hands. And this is the center of our feeling life. 
which is why, you know, people who are very connected with their feeling gesticulate so much with their hands. Somebody once told me, you know how to shut up an Italian? Just tell them to put their hands in their pocket. Yeah. So this is um, the, where we live in expression, don't we? Um, and when it gets really interesting is where's the center of the limbs then? Because they're not part of a sphere, or are they? Well, the limbs are a bit like radii of a sphere. So the bit that goes from the periphery to the center. Oh my goodness me, a geometrical drawing. So we have the center here, and then Stoner says something really intriguing. He says that the limbs are metamorphosed and inverted skull bones in human development. So those flat curved bones of the skull were turned inside out and metamorphosed into the tubular bones. And if you think that sounds way beyond me, I've got a very simple little thing I can show you to make it all much clearer. Think of a cube. Now turn that cube inside out. What do you have? No, you don't have another cube. <laughs> because you now have to find what's the opposite of a surface, what's the opposite of a corner, and what's the opposite of an edge. And what you end up with is something that looks like this. This is the shape of an inverted cube. Two intersecting circles, can you see? It's called an oloid. Yeah, absolutely fascinating thing. And you see this has no resemblance to the actual cube anymore. Now, this is why, it's, why this is so complicated. And there are amazing biologists who understand this much better than I do, and I'm not, even if I had the time, I wouldn't be able to do justice to this. Um, but I just love the, the, the weirdness, the, the amazingness of that thought, that um, something can be inverted as well as metamorphosed. So um, it gets slightly easier again after that. Um, when in this, the same lecture, um, he, he, goes, he becomes almost poetic. It's, it's about how things that happen outside of us affect us on the inside. And he says, anything that's structural or architectural on the outside of us touches us a little bit like music does. It makes us say of buildings sing in us, which is the first poetical thought. And the next one, I, it's one of my favorite thoughts in the whole lecture course. The experience of color is a movement which has ceased. Not color itself, but the experience of color. So um, behind Anna is a blue wall, and I'm experiencing that blue wall as a movement which has stopped. I'm not gonna go there anymore because you know sometimes you can talk too much about things. Um, you just have to read it for yourself and appreciate the poetry, the truth in this. I'm not gonna spoil it by talking about it. Um, in lecture 11, the focus is very much on what happens in the child um, as a result of what, what goes on physically. And he makes the rather startling statement that the mother's milk has the task of waking up the child's thinking. And you may think of that what you want, but it leads to another thought, which is actually, we can't put anything into the child's head. What we can do is wake up the forces that are already there. So we can activate the thinking, but we can't make a child think better or worse for that matter. And that I find interesting, that I find inspiring as a teacher. And how do children think? Well, broadly, they fall into two categories. There are memory children and fantasy children. And you will recognize this immediately if you've ta ever taught a class of kids. Memory children retain what you've given them and are able to reproduce and retell. Fantasy children reorganize what you've given them in their own universe. <laughs> um, doesn't mean that they don't benefit from your education. It just, they, it, they learn on their terms. Memory children learn on your terms. And if you're not a very good teacher, then you will prefer the memory children. 
um, because when you ask them a question, they tell you exactly what you said. Fantasy children will have reorganized the information, but they are, of course, the ones who will lead countries and invent engines and, you know, build wonderful buildings because um, we need that in the world as well. So can you accommodate both children, both types in your lessons? A big challenge for us as teachers. Now it gets weird again. In lecture 12, um, Steiner talks about the human head and explains that we sort of have animal tendencies in us that come to an expression in the way our heads are shaped. No, really. Um, and it's only the other parts of our organization that prevent us from living out our animal tendencies. So when I teach this course with lots of time, with, with teacher training students, we actually look at these images and I ask them, what is this person like? And what is that person like? I love these, these images here. Um, we don't have time to go there, but the point is, I guess, that we are quite able to overcome this one-sided tendency in ours, the inner pig or the inner ostrich. And we have narratives that explain that. We come across those in class two, for example, when we tell fables. You know that, that vain crow that drops the cheese because the clever fox persuades it to? That's not a crow, that's us, the greedy wolf. That's not um, Aesop being anti-wolfish. He's just telling us about the human being and about our one-sidednesses, which we need to overcome. And when we do fables and zoology with children, we can address that a little bit. If you were an animal, what animal would you be, do you think? And just like we have one-sided animal tendencies, we also have one-sided plant tendencies in us. And they don't live in the head, they live in the chest region, in our vegetative system, you could say. Um, in a little sidebar here that Steiner opens here, he says that actually for every disease we know, for every vegetative disease, there is an equivalent somewhere out in the plant world. And the most famous of that from an anthroposophical point of view is cancer and the mistletoe, yeah? where you have a, the tumor growths in the human being actually being treated by a preparation of the mistletoe, which is also an external um, element in the life of the tree that plays host to it. And in various ways, you can look at the human lung system or the liver system or something like that and find an equivalent to that in the plant world. By and large, it, it works because we're not going there. We're, we're human beings, we're not plants. So we don't allow this to take over, if you like. I'm gonna skip this particular one because that's too complicated even for now. Um, but I'm going to just look now at the last few thoughts here, um, because I like them so much. Um, Steiner talks about the difference between nervous systems and blood systems in our body quite a lot in various contexts in this course. So this is really, you know, biological, microbiological stuff, some of it. And about the nerves, he says, actually, they're dying all the time. Nerves are made from dead and dying matter. And then there's this rather poetic sentence that dead matter is to the spirit what glass is to the light. In other words, the nervous system lets the spirit in, lets the spirit through, which is why we can think, why we're so alive to the other people's thoughts and the thoughts that move the world and are all around us. Whereas the blood traps the spirit. It won't let the spirit through. It retains it instead, which is why we don't know with consciousness what happens in our blood system, but, but which is why, in the words of Mephisto in Goethe's Faust, blood is a special substance. And when we make a pact with the devil, we sign it with blood, not with ink, because that's where, this, where we know intuitively the spirit to reside. In the final lecture, Stella comes back once more to this threefoldness of the human aspect. And he says, actually, you'll find that everywhere. The head is still, 
and the brain sits in it, the spirit sits in it like a person driving in a railway carriage. This part of us has an exchange between stillness and movement, and the limbs move all the time. Actually, the same is true for the shoulder, the arm, and the hand, for the hips, the leg, and the foot, for the face, the, the forehead, the sense organs, and the jaw. You find this threefoldness absolutely everywhere, and it really um, informs and illustrates the spiritual nature of the physical human being. And before he finishes with us, he makes an appeal to those teachers, to those 24 people, some of whom will become the 12 first teachers of the first world of school. He says, whatever you do, whoever you are, there's one cardinal rule. Never, ever allow yourself to become pedantic. Don't do something because you ought to. There is always a choice. There is always more than one way to do a thing. And if you don't cultivate your imagination, you should look for a different job. That's what he says. Yeah? If you, if you, if you, some people are meant to be pedantic. That's fine. Just don't become a teacher then. Because you're in the wrong profession if you, if you are that. And I want to finish with a short quote that doesn't come from this lecture course, that comes from a few years later, in August 1924, when Steiner gave his last education lecture in Britain, or educational course of lectures, I should say. This was in Turkey, in Devon, um, where he spoke to the people who were going to be the founders of the first British Steiner School, the one that is now called Michael Hall and which is actually the longest continuously existing Steiner school in the world. No other school has been there as long continuously as Michael Hall has. And I think somebody must have asked him, you know that course you gave five years ago in, 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 in Stuttgart, this complicated course um, with all this stuff, studying all that about the human being, do we really need to go there? You know, we're English. We don't do theory. We, we want to know how we teach and why we teach and how, how much fun it is. And you've talked about all this, can't we just do that? I'm not suggesting that they said that, but they might have, because this is what he answered. You will be able to develop a life of imagination if you really and truly in your soul understand human nature. Knowing human nature lets your inner soul life thaw and brings a smile to your face. Ignorance breeds grumpiness. What rises up from a soul imbued with the living knowledge of human nature and expresses itself in the face, that's what makes a real educator. So, study this book. It'll make you smile.